Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. That was just a few moments, a brief moment, of one of World Jewry's treasures. A brief taste of the Hazamir International Jewish Teen Choir performing in one of their annual gala concerts. I'm Mark Golub, and there are many ways creative men and women make unique contributions to Jewish life. My guest of this edition of the Chaim is doing just that, using the gifts of music, choral music, to help fashion a superb choir of Jewish high school students from the United States and from Israel that has become world-renowned and whose sound elevates both the human soul and the Jewish spirit, or as the groove self-describes, it creates community through harmony. It's an honor for me to introduce you to Vivian Lazar, the director of the Hazamir International Jewish Teen Choir. It is such a kick for me to have you at this table. You and I go way, way back. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. First of all, what you've been able to craft, you and your husband, but you, with the International Teen Choir has been extraordinary. And I wish I could take everyone who watches JBS and L'Chaim and dro drop them in an audience somewhere, whether it's in David Geffen Hall, whether it's at the Met, whether it's uh, somewhere in Israel, whether it's at a synagogue somewhere across America. And they should hear and experience what you have created it is an extraordinary gift you've given to all of us. So, kola kavod to you, and mazal tov, you should continue to do this for years and years and years and years. It's a real honor again to have you here. You. I want to first know a little bit about you, and then we're going to talk about Hazamir. So, how do you end up <laughs> in this world of music as one of, the, you know, as one of those who's really fashioning what Jewish music means to many of us today? Where were you born, and what was your Jewish background, and who are you? I was born in New York, grew up in New York. And East side, west side, what? Island, South Shore. Really? Yeah. Okay. But I ran away early. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Um, but my mother was born in Brooklyn. My father was born in the Bronx. Named? Dorothy and Samuel Feinberg. Oak Bike Feinberg. They moved us to Far Rockaway. Yes. When... We were in elementary school because they wanted us to be in a Jewish community. Yes. They chose between Far Rockaway and Great Neck. Yes. And both were pretty undeveloped at the time. And um, I grew up in a very nurturing Jewish environment. Did you? Yes. Siblings? One sister. One sister. Debbie. Older or younger? Younger. Okay, Debbie's your younger sister. Yes. Tell me about the nurturing Jewish environment in your home. My father was a Renaissance man. He had taught in Columbia University for seven years and left when he realized as a Jew he would not get tenure. And he went to law school and became a lawyer. My mother was a housewife until 
I entered junior high school and then went back and got her master's. Both my parents, by the way, were college graduates. They lived through the Depression, and both were college graduates. This was unusual. Though, Very so. unusual. Um, my mother became a librarian. So we were surrounded by books. We had subscriptions to the Philharmonic, to Loom, the light opera of Manhattan, which was all the Gilbert and Sullivan. My father loved opera, which I didn't at the time, but to this day I can sing almost any aria, uh -huh. even though I had my hands across my ears <laughs> whenever he played. And um, which, What was his favorite opera? Aida. I knew it! Well, I'll tell you a funny story. In those days, my parents got married in the 40s, and then my father was drafted. And he was in India and China for many, many years, so they didn't start a family until much later. But my father and his best friend, Bernie, Goldberg, Go Bernie Greenberg, who happened to be um, Rabbi Jerry Skolnick's uncle, would go to the Met, and they would get hired as extras. They would be put in full uniform and costume, stand on the stage with spears, and told, if you open your mouth, <laughs> you're subject to death. <laughs> and that's how they would get to see operas, because they didn't have money mm -hmm. to go to the opera in those days. And that's how much he loved the opera. That's amazing. That's a wonderful story. Yeah. Do you know the opening aria of Aida? I once did. Celeste Celeste Aida. Aida. Oh, of course, yes. A great, great opera. Yes. So you grow up with opera and Gilbert and Sullivan. Yes. I am the very Men model of, of a modern, modern major, major general. general. Yes. Did you like Gilbert and Sullivan I as a kid? I loved Gilbert and Sullivan. Mm -hmm. I loved rock and roll. I loved any kind of music. And even in elementary school, my friends and I were always singing. I think kids sang in those days because they didn't have, you know. <laughs> yes, right. So, um, Broadway shows? Everyone knew it by heart, beginning to end with the dialogue. With the dialogue, With too. the dialogue. My Fair Lady. I loved Camelot. Camelot. Oklahoma and Carousel were a little before me. Yes. I did like the music. I yes. didn't know them as yes. well. Yes. I loved Golden Boy. Yes. I saw Barbara Streisand in Funny, Funny Girl. Girl. I snuck into what the theater. What you say you saw her? I snuck into the theater with a friend. You saw her on stage. On stage. Oh, wait. I did, too. I'm at Columbia. I go to see her. Standing room. I'm in the back. I was in standing room, too. Maybe we were next to each other. It might have been the exact same <laughs> night. Oh, wait. I consider it to be the single most breathtaking moment that I have been in theater, and I have been fortunate enough to be in theater professionally later on, but and there have been some fabulous yes. performances. Yes. Barbara Streisand standing alone in front of a stage doing My Man. Yes. You remember? I get chills. I get chills. Yes. Just thinking yes. about it. Yes. yes. What an extraordinary talent she was and still is. But, so you were there. I was there. Uh, forum? No. Fiddler? Oh, of course, Forum. Fiddler, Forum, yeah. All I, I, I wasn't a theater person the way you were, so I didn't know them that intimately by name. Uh -huh. Yes, I saw them all in those days. Okay. And what about yourself musically? Um, I was just a singer, not a trained singer, until um, I think in my 20s I started studying voice. Okay, and for all of what your parents did give you, they did not insist that you learn a musical instrument. Oh, I took piano lessons ah. with Jane Samoji, who was a singer in the Robert Shaw Chorale. And I also played the guitar. Folk? Just, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still? No. Um, I, when I joined Zamir, yes. I met the real musicians. Yes. And when I w saw what they were doing, <laughs> actually the first time I saw somebody brilliant play the guitar. I sold my Goya guitar. I understand. It's, it was a stupid thing to do, but I, I know, did it. I know, but I understand. And then I married Mati Lazar, who is a brilliant pianist. I dust the piano. <laughs> I haven't touched it in years. I understand completely. But you did have some real musical oh, yes. training as oh, a yes. child. Oh, yes. And here you love all kinds of music. But I do. You've mentioned many kinds of music. Although you may not have loved opera, you're hearing opera. You got Gilbert and Sullivan, you got Broadway shows, you got the pop music yeah. of your era. And Jewish music. Tell Seymour, me about Jewish Seymour music. Seymour Silbermans was my choral teacher. In, I went to a school called Hailei, which was a Jewish day school, a modern Jewish day school. 
and he taught the choir there and in just about every Jewish day school in the tri-state area. He was a very special man who probably brought Jewish choral music to the tri-state area for the first time. That's he and wonderful. Vel Pasternak. And he taught us Hebrew songs, which we would sing on Shabbat, my friends and I, when we got together. Um, but we would also sing Peggy Sue and Bar Bar Barbara Ann. That's and fabulous. We just needed to sing. In your home, since you were going to a, you were going to a modern Orthodox day school, yes? Was that also the tenor of your home, modern yes. Orthodox? Yes, yes. Okay, so you had an observant home. Yes. Kashrut. Yes. Shabbat on Friday night. Yes. Okay, so you were steeped both in music and in Judaism, yes? yes? When you described your father, I don't know where that came from in him and your mother. Where do you think that comes from in them? At That's what point question. do they? I don't know. My father's mother died when she was 27. He was farmed out to his grandparents, who were my great-grandparents. My great-grandmother wore a horsehair shadle wig, and my grandfather had one of those big black, my great-grandfather, big black yam kipot with a long black. They were Lubavitch, not Chabad Lubavitch, uh -huh. real Lubav old Lubavitch. And that's how my father was brought up. He left that and became an observant Jew, but a very modern observant Jew. And culture was very important in our home. Art, books, music, dance. It was all part of our upbringing. It wasn't even something we thought yes. about. It was just air that we breathed. You were very lucky, you know. I only realized that in the last decade or so. I understand that, too. We never realize. I thought everybody lived the way I no. did. No, no, you were very, very lucky. Um, so, were you in any kind of Jewish youth group, youth program oh, as yeah. a kid? I was in B'nai Akiva. Um, I was a leader in USY. Uh -huh. um, we had what we called the Oneg groups, but they were they were real groups. They weren't denominational. They were community own egg groups where every week we'd meet in somebody else's house and there was an older person, I guess teenager, who would lead our groups. Um, community was always ingrained. It, mm -hmm. Again, it wasn't something we thought about. It was a given. Yes. And the community I grew up in was a very cohesive community. And the parents of the children that we grew up with were all nurturing to all of us so we lived in everybody's house and it was something that we all took for granted and to this day when I look back on it I realized that it was something unusual probably specific to small growing communities that were just starting to flourish but I didn't know that I lived in a small Jewish community that was just starting to flourish I lived at home with all my friends and we drove our, we rode our bikes to school, and our parents picked us up if we had basketball practice in the evening, and it was just life. That was wonderful. Remember Passover for me at your, when you were growing up on the island. What was a Seder like for you? The Seder for me growing up was very intellectual. My father would prepare and give beautiful divrei Torah on on the Haggadah, and Seder 1 was not the same as Seder 2. And it was very intense and very heavy and very erudite. And I didn't always appreciate it as a young child, but looking back on it, um, as you said, I'm, I was very, very blessed to grow up in an environment that was so steeped in learning and erudition. What was as you look back on it, what was the, the loveliest part of your Jewish upbringing, Jewish home, whether it was Shabbat, whether it was something else? But just talk for a moment about what it was that made Jewishness so special for you growing up. Without question, it was all the friends and people around me. I didn't, I didn't celebrate Shabbat alone. I celebrated Shabbat with 25 best friends. 
we would walk in the streets holding hands. There were very few cars in the streets where I grew up on Shabbat, and we were always together. So it was cool, it was in, I didn't think of it that way, but it wasn't lonely. It wasn't a day of you may not. It was a day of look at what we can do together. And it was a social day from beginning to end. I went to shul in the morning, but I sat with my friends. I came home for lunch with friends, or I went to their house for lunch, and then we were together all afternoon through Shalashudas, through Havdalah in somebody's house. And then when we had to come home, we would get on the phone and talk to each other. So I think that the community is always key to feeling comfortable with being Jewish. I, I look at Chabad Shluchim who go to Ghana and Kenya and set up homes for the few Jews there, and I give them so much credit because they're doing it in such isolation, and it takes courage and, and great dedication to do that. Chil most children don't have that. And where I grew up, I didn't need it. You have a strong Jewish identity yes. from childhood. What about you and Israel? Huh. Israel was always there, but it wasn't something that was as um, heavy in our lives until 1967. Part of that is because the community members who had gone through the Holocaust or had, who had parents who had gone through the Holocaust didn't talk about the Holocaust, and they didn't talk about Israel in terms of the Holocaust either. But in 1967, the Zamir Corral was slated to go to Israel for the first time, and then the war broke out. And we didn't know if we were going or not. We were, everybody was in upheaval. We were a bunch You of, were already in. Yes. I was a young teenager. When did you first join Most Zamir? Most people joined um, post-high school. Um, there were exceptions. Mati was a big exception. Mati was accepted at 15, but besides the conductor, he was the only person who could read music. So there are always exceptions. Um, when was it founded? 1960. By who? Stanley Sperber. Why? It came out of the Mossad choir, the Mossad camp. Mossad was a Hebrew-speaking camp in Pennsylvania, and it was a very successful camp. It was the first Hebrew-speaking camp. And many Flatbush Yeshiva and Ramaz students went there because they spoke Hebrew. I went there even though I didn't really speak Hebrew. And Stanley was a sports counselor. But the counselors would have a counselor's choir every summer. And in 1960, these counselors said, why do we have to stop singing in September? Let's keep singing. And Stanley knows how to read music, so he's going to conduct us. And Stanley Sperber since went on to be a very good, wonderful conductor who lives in Israel now. But they started this choir with 12 singers. In 1969, I think Zamir was 100 singers, 110 Amazing. singers. And you joined before the Six-Day War? I jo yes, I joined in 67. And Mari was already there? Oh, yeah. He was there, I think, since uh, in 65. OK. And the war was over in six days, and we went to Israel. And Who's we? All of Zamir Corral, 80 the, of us. Really? All of us. You got on a plane and you went? We got on a plane and we went. I get chills. It was um, life-changing for tell, every I, single person. Tell me. So first of all, the Israel that we met was not the Israel of the Bible that we had been studying in school. They were, you know, the, we didn't see Abraham, our patriarch, walking with a flock of sheep. We saw a vibrant city in Jerusalem, a vibrant city in Tel Aviv, but more important, we saw a country that was celebrating. People would stop on the corners and hug us for being in Israel. People would stop on streets and start singing. They'd start dancing. It was, we call it a messianic era. Looking back, I guess it wasn't so messianic, but we thought it was at the time. And for those of us American kids who only knew about the news from television and newspapers, this was such a shocking eye-opener to see a modern country. Revelatory. Had, revelatory. And it had a, a country that had obliterated major neighbors all around it, this tiny little thumbnail of a country. 
and we celebrated for six weeks throughout the summer. Some of us never came home. There were people who stayed in Israel and called their parents and said, we're not returning, and who still live there. Friends of yours? Yeah. Many of us, made, not many of our friends, made Aliyah within the next three years and still live there. And those of us who didn't make Aliyah go to Israel frequently and have been staunch supporters of Israel throughout. And to the audience, my disclaimer is that I am an unapologetic lover of Israel. And just like I love my children and don't always approve of what they do, I love Israel. I don't always approve of what it does, but I always love Israel and I always support Israel. That is wonderful to hear. I could not agree more. So at what point does Vivian and Muddy notice each other? We knew each other for many, many years. We were in the same group of friends early on. If you were in Zamir, we were friends. It was a real community in and of itself, was it, it not? It still is. It's a, it's a family. It is so a and family. It, what's interesting to me, and you'll tell me if I've got it right, um, there are young people who come into Zamir, and then their life takes them here, there, everywhere. They retain a connection to Zamir, whether they're singing yeah. actively or not. Is that a fair thing to say? It is a fair thing to say. I think there are a few reasons for that. One is choral singers are um, very community-minded because you cannot choral sing alone. I can't, I can't sing a choral piece for you now. I need three other people, at least, to pull that off. So choral singers believe in community. They recognize what community is and how important it is. The other reason, I think, in terms of Zamir is that we have a very charismatic conductor. And people glean onto people. And once you've worked with Mati, it's very hard to work with anybody else. He is an extraordinary human being. He is. And he's an extraordinary conductor and musician. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that he has that we're, we're trying to nurture through Hazamir is an understanding and a knowledge of Jewish text, Jewish culture, Jewish tradition, Jewish law, and the music that he conducts. So when he is teaching you a piece of music, he's also teaching you something about your Jewishness. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. How did he learn mm. enough to be able to do that? He was also brought up in a modern Orthodox home. He went to a Jewish day school through eighth grade, and then he went to music and art. He went to music and art. Here in New York? Yes, here in New York. And he went to Herzliya High School in the evening because his parents wanted him to continue his Jewish education. <laughs> and frankly, he never stopped studying. Mati doesn't read fiction. He only reads nonfiction. I only read fiction. <laughs> um, and he reads Nacham uh -huh. on Friday, and he reads science books on Tuesday, and he reads history books on Wednesday. So he's retained a lot of information, and he's smart. But being Jewish has been very important for both of us. Both our parents gave us that independently. And it, it's not just us. I think it's not uncommon in my generation for people who grew up in Jewish homes, whether they were Orthodox or conservative or reform, to have a very strong connection to Judaism. OK, I want to stress this point. You know. There are choirs that sing, and that's what they do. They sing. And the repertoire is whatever the repertoire is. Hazamir is more than people singing. There is a Jewish component to it that is almost served by the music, as opposed to the music being an end in and of itself. Is that a fair thing for me to say? That happens to be our mission. Our mission is to strengthen Jewish identity in a pluralistic setting. We are not a religious organization. We are a Jewish organization. We have Jews of all stripes. We have teens who are totally unaffiliated, who've never had a bar mitzvah. We have Israelis who've never heard the word kiddush, certainly not havdalah. But we're all Jewish. We embrace everybody and we serve everybody. 
We do that through the music. And the audience is served as well. I often say that Hazamir is a utopian community. And if we could export it, all our problems would be over. I agree with you, by the way. And I don't say that lightly. We actually have our singers introduce the pieces. And they give messaging through those, their own messaging of what Hazamir means to them on the stage. That's wonderful. And so the message of Hazamir, which is excellence in music, Jewish identity, pluralism, community building, leadership, and love of Israel is built throughout the entire program. It's a model. Vivian, yeah. it's a model. Yeah. And it's a, a, in some way, it's a shame that what you've just described doesn't reflect Jewish life as a whole in America. Do you know what I'm talking I about? I certainly do. Uh, you and I would love that to be the model. There's, there's so much back and forth and anger and disagreement and issues. It's all nonsense. We're all Jews. There is you know, either your Ohev Yisrael and Yisrael here has a double meaning, both of the state of Israel and also the Jewish That's people. Right. You know, people say to me, what kind of rabbi are you? I'm an Ohev Yisrael rabbi. I don't consider myself a rabbi of any movement. I consider, and I, again, I had a very lucky background that you don't, you, it's inheritance. I didn't earn it. But every one of the main, main movements of my life Every one of the main movements of Judaism are in my experience. And to me, it's all the Jewish people. You know, one of the interesting things that happens at our festival, we, we have a, a three-day festival before the gala concert where all 400 of our singers from around the world meet in a hotel for intensive rehearsals, for social activities. And on Shabbat, we have a traditional service an egalitarian service, a reform service, and a women's service. And for many of our kids, both on the reform side and the orthodox side, they taste each other's services. And what they recognize when they're in those services is the devotion and the devout feeling of all of the children who are, who are praying in their services. There are differences in the way they pray, but there is no difference in the communication that they speak to God. And we're very proud of the fact that we can expose children to this, teenagers to this, in a safe environment where they're being supervised and inform them about the ability to be a Jew in many different ways. That is lovely. And that's something that the Israelis really appreciate, because in Israel, we all know, you can be this or you can be that, but there's not too much in the middle. Yes. You are the director of the teen division. Yes. But we, people should understand, Hazamir is not only teens. Hazamir is teens. The Zamir Choral Foundation that's from, yeah, yes. is the umbrella organization of Jewish choral activity in North America. Matthew Lazar, my husband, started this foundation. And the project, the first project, was Zamir Koral, which actually became the foundation, and that's the adult choir. There is a North American Jewish Choral Festival every summer, which is like the Berkshire Choral Festival or the Tanglewood Choral Festival for adults, but it's Jewish music. Even though non-Jews come to it, five or 600 people every summer come to that five-day festival. Then there is Hazamir, which is the teen arm, which I direct. Correct. And we have our newest choir, which is called Zamir No Dead, which is a choir for 18 to 30-year-olds. And that choir was established four years ago by Hazamir alumni who went onto the college campuses in New York City and came to us and said, we can't find any great music. You need to start a choir for us. And Zamir No Dead now has these young people singing, and they are brilliant. They are Hazamir matured. Yes. And they are truly brilliant. If someone's watching right now and says, oh, I want to be in some Zamir group, is it possible? 
Yes. How? They have to audition. Mm -hmm. But it's, auditions are open to everybody. We are a foundation that promotes excellence in music. And as you know, excellence is not a word that's bandied around too much in the Jewish world. Uh, we hear a lot about let's meet them where they are. And my, uh, my answer to that is I'll meet you there, but I won't stay there with you. I will raise you up or I will help, or my program, I don't mean me, but our program will help you raise, be raised. And um, I think that by maintaining a standard, we, we stand not quite alone. There are one or two other choirs that are Jewish choirs that are also audition choirs, but I don't think there are more than those other two. And community choirs, by the way, are wonderful, and we promote them, but they're different, yes. and they serve a different purpose. Yes. Have you ever had problems because of your insistence on excellence? Has the Jewish community, has the Jewish world ever given you grief? The Jewish world hasn't given us grief, but they also haven't given us great support. Why? I think part of it is because our numbers will never be 3,000. As it is, we've maxed out of stages already. We barely fit on the stage of Car Carnegie Hall. Two more kids on stage, and we would not have been able to What's be on the stage. What's your number now? Our number t this year is a little under 400. All at one time? Oh, yeah. You have almost 400 kids. On a stage. That's without the alumni who join us for, for the finale. <laughs> we were over 500 on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera House. Oh, my goodness. And one of the great moments of that evening was on the spot, Mati decided to end the program after the encore with Hatikva. And almost 4,000 people in the audience and over 500 on the stage sang Hatikva on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera. Oh. That was... Vivian. You know, I won't imagine, by the way, there were tears flowing everywhere. Everywhere. The, mini the director of music for the Ministry of Education for the State of Israel was with us in the audience. And his mouth was open. He couldn't believe it. One of the things you do, by the way, is you bring both Israelis and American Jews together. Yes. We have 38 Hazamir chapters. 31 are in America and 7 are in Israel. Two things. How do the Israeli kids respond to the concept? And what is the interaction between Israeli teens and American teens? The Israeli, first of all, the Israeli teens love Hazamir. They know it's a gift. It's a gift because they get to come to America every year. But they also perform in Israel for very important events. They just performed in the fall for World Progressive Judaism. Natan Sharansky was introducing them. Um, but they love Hazamir. Their conductors are very serious about Hazamir. And when they come to America, we send each chapter to a different city for three or four days before the festival to live with Hazamir singers in America. So not only do they get a taste of American home life, and American life, but they make fast friends with Americans. And we have Hazamir kids, Hazamir young people, who are now close to 30, who are still in touch with their American friends. Our American Hazamir kids stay with their Hazamir friends in Israel when they visit. The Israelis stay with American friends when they come to America to visit. They're in touch on email, on Facebook. It's a very vibrant community. And the Israeli community, is perhaps more active because it's smaller and the country is smaller. Mm -hmm. But in essence, the kids do get along well with each other. Oh, yes. We ha at, at our festival, we have something called Mifgash, which is an encounter where we put five Israelis and five Americans at a table. We give them a facilitated question, and then we leave them alone. And they talk for two hours. What's a facilitated question? Um, all of you consider yourselves Jewish, but some of you are Jewish by observance, and some of you are Jewish by birth. Is there a difference? It's 
provocative. It's a good question for adults as well. Yes. yes. And then they take the conversation wherever it goes. And there might be 10 or 12 of these tables around a room. And at the end of the two hours, one person from each table stands up to report. Yes. I don't want to make it sound like this is some kind of Pollyanna messianic world that you've created. But my experience has been that it's almost as if Israelis and American Jews put their arms around each other and sing and are experiencing something they love together. And it, it brings them closer together. That's my experience. Am I, again? You're, you're entirely right. Many of our Israeli kids from Beit Sha'an, from Ashkelon, come to America not speaking English. Yes. But they all speak a common language because when we start singing, we've all learned the same music. And they all start singing that music together. And that is a very strong communication and a very strong bonding. I want you to talk to me about your sense of what music is. You're the director of a major choral group in the world. And I will tell you a story, and then I want you to comment on it. And it, it occurred to me as you were talking about how when you have uh, your, at some point during the year, you're getting together, and on, on Shabbat there are different services. And that whether one is an Orthodox Jew or a Reformed Jew or a conservative Jew, one ultimately learns about the other from the service that they experience. And what I have seen is very often it's the music of a service <laughs> which touches the human heart and soul. And the story I want to tell you is on JBS we televise every Friday night Shabbat services from Central Synagogue. Mm -hmm. Central Synagogue is a bastion of Reform Judaism. The service is a Reform service. But it happens to be one of the finest musical presentations on a Friday night and has been a model. When I was first a rabbi, you know, the whole idea was there could be no musical instruments. Right. Now, slowly, throughout the Reform movement, throughout conservative Judaism, whether you've been a Jeshurun here in New York, and on the fringes of some modern Orthodox synagogues, there is more and more music and more and more musical instruments. So Central Synagogue does fabulous music at its Friday night service, and we're televising it all over America. I'm having Orthodox Jews tell me that they have a new appreciation for what non-Orthodox Judaism is because of Central Synagogue. They don't mean the tefillah. They don't mean whatever sermon the rabbi gives. They're talking about the music that comes out of a Shabbat experience from Central Synagogue. So when you tell me that you experience when you have kids who are experiencing different kinds of services, in large measure, it is the music. And so my overall question for you is, talk to me from your experience, both as a professional and as a committed Jew. The power of music to convey something that is transcendent even within the Jewish community and the Jewish world. Everything you've said I agree with. Rabbi Angela and Cantor Dan, Dan Mutlu in Central Synagogue are brilliant, both of them. Music exists in time. So when I tell you I heard a great piece of music, that's not going to give you a chill. But if I play the music for you, it might, if it's, a, if it's something that engages you. I think the whole idea of having a chazan in a, t in a synagogue, and there are chazanim cantors in Orthodox synagogues too. Why? Because music elevates us. It's non-discursive communication, and it's something that has an emotional connection that words generally don't. Words are very limiting, and music is very expansive. So when we listen to music, we might get a reaction. When we participate in music, 
we might get a different reaction. And one of the things missing, I think, from our world is active listening today. Because when we go to the symphony, if anybody goes to the symphony, or if you go to a rock concert and you're listening to Lady Gaga, you're listening, you're not singing with her, and you're, you're feeling something very strong. When you go to these services, this, whether they're in the Hazamir, at the Hazamir Festival or if it's Central Synagogue, you are experiencing this elevation that I think would touch even a non-Jew. You don't have to be Jewish to be touched by music. Jewish music might be a certain kind of music, but it's also taken on the taste of the society in which it lives, and that's been true for millennia. So I, th I think that the music is key, and I can tell you that many people I know, and myself included, have never had a stronger prayer experience than when I'm singing. Are there times when you'll hear Azamir singing at you and you get chills? <laughs> it happened today. I listened to a recording of something that's being performed at the concert. It, it's a song by, about Ron Arad, who was the colonel in the Air Force who was shot down in 1986 and captured by the Shiites and then passed to Hezbollah. And to this day, we still don't know what happened to him, although we presu presume he's dead. And it's a song called Kshetavo, and it's a haunting song. And I had to listen to it today because I had to send a recording to, to somebody. And I hadn't heard it in a while. And it chilled me so much that it, I had to calm myself before I continued working. Now, I don't know if everybody reacts to music that way. I do. I do, too. I think a lot of people I do. do. I think you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, I'm thinking of, of the way in which Abraham Joshua Heschel talked about the experience of awe and how there are things in this universe, both in nature and in human beings, which are awe-inspiring. They just fill one with awe. And that it's that experience of awe that one begins to sense the divine somewhere, this what Heschel calls a mystery. It's a mystery. The Jewish tradition, when you, one really understands the Jewish tradition, the Jewish tradition does not define God. God is a mystery. We don't know what, but we experience. Sometimes what the Jewish tradition calls the Shekhinah, is in our, we are in the presence of something extraordinary. And very, for many people, it is music that somehow is a window into that moment. And so you should understand what you're doing is not only, you're not only doing something professionally extraordinary in music, you're not only doing something that really touches and expands Jewish understanding. You are doing something, Vivian, which every now and then unlocks the treasure of the divine in this universe. And it's for that that every one of us who knows you and knows what Zamir, the Zamir Foundation does and what Zamir does, are grateful to you beyond words. Thank you.
So at what point do you become director of Hazamir? So I taught uh, in a school for the gifted and talented for 20 years. I was an English teacher and a dance teacher. And in 2000 something, I had had enough. Um, not of the kids, the kids were phenomenal, but the school system was, I was, I was not happy. So I left and even my last year or so of teaching to nourish me on my free periods, I would call the office and say, what's going on? What can I help you with? And Hazamir, when I took over, was eight chapters. And because I had this educational background, I saw the potential to change the model of Hazamir, to grow Hazamir. And I started doing it on a volunteer basis. And like many things in the Jewish world, all of a sudden there I was in the director's chair. And I have to say it was the greatest gift that ever came my way. Mm -hmm. I feel so blessed to be working with young people, with the music that I love, with the Judaism that I love, with the community that I love. Everything that I love the most, including my husband, is surrounding me in this work. So my granddaughter even sings in Hazamir. Really? Yes. You look too young to have a granddaughter. I started young. My son started young. Doesn't take much. What's your granddaughter's name? Ness. Ness. Miracle. Yes. That's lovely. That's lovely. Um, because you do deal with young people, I want to ask you one general question. There are those in the Jewish community who are very worried about the next generation. There's a feeling that there is not as much of a Jewish identity among the vast numbers of young Jews in America. And some real question as to where their parents are in terms of support of Israel and where they will be. Now you deal with a select population. I'm not asking about the, the Hazamir population, but you see Jewish life as well. I want to know, Vivian, what's your feeling? What worries you? And is there anything that gives you serious hope that the Jewish future is secure, given the fact that we, we live in a country with extraordinary rates of assimilation, extraordinary rates of intermarriage, extraordinary rates of non-affiliation, and for all of the pockets of very exciting Jewish things that are happening, they are dwarfed by the the desert of Jewish life throughout America. So I want to know how you view it and what you feel about the future. I view it the way you view it. I think that you've explained it very well. I worry terribly. I think that we're going to see a very, a very strong remodeling of the Jewish community in the next generation or two. But I also believe that Netzach Yisrael lo yishaker, that the Jewish people are eternal. That's not an exact. Close that, enough. Close enough, OK. And that those children that we have in our orbit, whether it's Jewish day school, Jewish camping, Hazamir, Jewish youth groups, will be our saviors. They will perpetuate us. In what numbers? Hard to say. You know, the Jews of France are all leaving. The Jews of France are afraid to be in France. Who would have ever thought? Israel is our home. Israel will also save us. Maybe that's where we need to end up. It's probably where we all should be. There's plenty of room for all of us. But I do believe that we will be perpetuated. I never worry that we will be eradicated. I don't feel that way about the state of Israel but I do feel that way about the people of Israel. You worry about the future of the state of Israel? I worry. I don't worry keeping myself up at night, but I know that we live under, we, I, I guess we live under an existential threat mm -hmm. of annihilation. Iran, Russia, the neighbors, but I do believe that the Jewish people, just look at history. They, the expulsion of the, of the Jews from Spain, the pogroms, the Holocaust, the worst thing that could ever have happened to us. But we survived. 
What is sad is that our memories are so short that even today with the survivors still alive, there are Jewish children who don't know what the Holocaust is. There are people who, who deny that it ever happened. Our memories are short, but our longevity is, is permanent. You're fabulous, you know. I love you very much. Thank what you. What you're doing is extraordinary. Thanks, Mark. That you would come and sit here with us is wonderful. I wish you called tuva Thank you. All happiness, both personal and professional, you and Mari, what you're doing is wonderful with Zamir and Hazamir. I hope there are all the times when you and I will have a chance to sit at this table together. Thank you. Thank you, darling. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Vivian Lazar, the director of the Hazamir International Jewish Teen Choir. And if you want to learn more about the Teen Choir, visit their website at zamirchoralfoundation.org. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed here on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends, to life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.